Hey folks, welcome to The Artist Craft. I'm your host, Stacey Cochran, and we are joined in studio today by an outstanding author. Miriam Heron was born in Miami, Florida. Uh, she earned a PhD in English from the University of South Carolina, and she taught literature at a number of universities, including Limestone College in South Carolina, Essex County College in New Jersey, Appalachian State University, and Greensboro College in North Carolina. She has been on the editorial staff of Good Housekeeping Magazine and the Winston-Salem Journal. She has also freelanced as a writer, editor, public relations consultant, and film and video producer. For six years in Charlotte, she volunteered her time to develop and coordinate a program for Southeast Asian teenagers whose families were refugees from the Vietnam War. She and her husband live in Greensboro, and Absolution, which I have a copy of here, is her first novel. Thank you very much for joining us in studio. Thank you, Stacy. I appreciate you having me here. Well, tell us a little bit about Absolution. Primarily, what was the genesis for this? What made you want <laughs> to write this book? You know, I'm not ever sure I want to write a book when I start. I have kind of, I want to write some book, mm -hmm. but not a particular book. And when I started this, I really was thinking, well, I had tried some things. I tried a long historical novel. I tried other things and thought, let me write something simple, which uh, if you've read Absolution, it didn't turn out that way. I thought, well, I'll write something that some tracks people. some of my own life that I lived so that I won't have to do all that research. Uh, actually, I, when I started tracking some of the years I'd lived through, I came upon the 1960s. So I didn't have any choice but to then dig down and do a lot of research and look at the 60s and the war and how it affects today. Where did the, where did the idea for, the, for absolution begin? Was it with a character or was, was it with the, with the plot itself? It was definitely with a character. Uh, I always start, well, I start various places, but I started with a character, a woman who was a widow, I thought, and I was going to have it set all in North Carolina, and then it didn't happen that way. Somehow it ended up in Boston. Somehow it ended up that she was married to a former Special Forces officer. Uh, these things sort of come in the process, and sometimes that's the mystery of writing. So is, is a novel, is it really a, the composite of a lot of different memories and then your imagination kind of working in tandem with that, do you think? You know, I, I wish that I knew what it actually was. I, I find writing is like life. You know, we never know quite where life's going to take us. We meet a person, and that person takes us to another person, and we go, and I think when you start a book, it's sort of happens that way, and which means I have to do a lot of rewriting because I have to fix what I didn't fix in the beginning. Sure. So how long did it take you to, to write the first draft of Absolution? Well, I started one draft back in the 90s and uh, decided to lay it aside, wasn't happy with it. That was the North Carolina version. Later I, was, I came back to it after 2002. At that point it took me maybe a year or two to write a draft, and then I wrote many, many drafts after that. So how would you describe your revision process? We're talking a little bit about, about how long it takes, but uh, is, is the revision process for you, is it something that you're doing as you're writing the book? Uh, is it something that you do after the book is done, after the first draft is done, uh, or is it both? How do you get feedback? Do you have readers who read it? I do both. I write, I rewrite constantly. I feel like once I get to a point where I don't like what I'm writing and I'm bored with it, I have to go back and rewrite it and make it so it's something I like and keeps me interested. Then I have readers at various points. Uh, I were, I've dealt with groups at times with uh, folks that kind of will read your stuff and be hard on you sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, I have other readers that I really trust and when I have a complete draft, then I actually it's a very important time for other readers. Hmm. So what was the most challenging thing about writing Absolution uh, in terms of the story itself? What was, what was the most difficult for thing, thing for you to to either revise or, or come to a sense of, of peace about? I think the most challenging was to write about Vietnam in Vietnam because I, w I have never been there and I didn't go there. I feel, like, I feel like as a writer you should go to these places, you should see them, but that really wasn't something I felt able to do and to write, write about the 60s. So that was very challenging and uh, I've always expected to get a letter from somebody saying, you didn't know what you were talking about. Uh, but I actually that hasn't happened. I even got 
So how did you meet the challenge? What, what did you do to, to overcome the, the fact that you hadn't visited? A lot visited of research. There? A lot of it on, online. I found amazing things online. I found a whole set of army maps from the 1960s I could download mm -hmm. to my computer that showed all these places in Vietnam. I talked to people who had been there, mm -hmm. and they read over some of my stuff and corrected it. Is that something you would change? Like if you're, you're I think you're working on a second novel now, or nearly mm -hmm. done with a second novel. Uh, is, 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 was that a challenge that you said, okay, I want to try to set this next novel in something that I'm really, really familiar with? <laughs> or not? Not at all. No. Now I'm back in the second. You like the challenges. I'm then. in the second Seminole Indian War, the oh, I love it. 1830s. So not at all. This is all research. So when did you decide on your title for, for Absolution? At the very end. I did not know my title until I wrote the end of the book. What, is, what does Absolution mean to you, and, and how does it fit within the context and the themes that you're developing in the story? Well, it's, I, it's, I always hesitate to talk about the title because I feel like if you haven't read the book, uh, it's an important statement at the end of the book. But it, I, I deal in a time of what I call a split in the American psyche of the Vietnam War mm -hmm. era. At some point, it, I, I like to think that you know my two characters represent sort of two sides of that and that Richard, who is the former Special Forces officer, has to deal with his past and what he finds, even at his, the point of mm -hmm. the end of his life, is absolution, kind of uh, a forgiveness, a kind of you know, what mm -hmm. we have done and how we've done it. How important is forgiveness to you? Oh, I think it's very important. I think that we all have to forgive ourselves all along in our lives. That we, uh, you know, we we do things that we should maybe we maybe there are a lot of things we don't do even. And I think that, and I also think, as people, and and I see this as a, a book about a marriage. And a marriage, one has to forgive each other. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're a little extreme in their marriage since they came from two sides of the '60s, but. They have to forgive each other. This might sound like a stupid question, but is, is forgiveness to you, do you see it as more of a, a Western kind of philosophical ideal, or is it universal? Well, I think it's, it's part of, you know, I, I don't know if I, I, yeah, I think it's, I mean, it may be a Western. It's, it's certainly with the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's a mm -hmm. Western idea that, and certainly in, in some faiths, uh, you know, you just have to wait till the next life to work it out. Or, or whatever, but I think that it's, for Western people, I do think it's an important thing to, to get beyond what has hung us up, hmm. and that we actually can get beyond it, and which maybe we can't sometimes. Well, the author, again, is Miriam Heron. We're talking about her book, Absolution. Uh, specifically, we're talking a lot about the writing process, sort of the mindset that goes into the book. But uh, tell, tell our, our viewers, the folks watching the interview, a little bit about what the story is about. Give them sort of the the, the sixty second you know synopsis. The sixty second. Well, it basically begins with with a murder of a, a man who is a former special forces officer, and it's a random shooting in a drugstore. And the rest of the book is dealing with as his wife tries to understand what happened in a bookstore. Whether this was just not a bookstore, drugstore. Mm -hmm. uh, I have books on my mind today. Sure, I wonder why. So. Um, that is this a random shooting or did this somehow his service in Vietnam trigger some kind of overreaction mm -hmm. uh, flashback? And as she goes through, she talks to various folks that knew him and, and learns a lot about his war experiences. And in some ways it's a story of their marriage too as we go back in time to the 60s. Hmm. So one of the things that's fascinating to me about this is, I, I would call this a literary novel, but there are certainly elements of a mystery to it, in, in your own mind, what is the, what's the major difference between a mystery and, and what we would call you know, literary fiction? Yeah. Is well, there a difference? You know, I, I'm never sure I'm writing literary fiction. I attempt to write literary fiction, but mm -hmm. you know, my editors say it's literary fiction. So you know, in terms of a mystery, I see that part of what I write about and I think what I'm fascinated about is the past and how the past affects us in the present a mystery to us as we go through life. We often have to dig back and find out mm. some of this. Fascinating. Again, the author is Miriam Heron. The book is Absolution. Uh, it's available at, at bookstores online, of course, and, and area bookstores as well. Uh, the, the, another cool thing about this book uh, for folks here in North Carolina who are watching this interview is, is that it actually won the Novella Festival Press 
Award for, for Best First Novel. So tell us a little bit about, take us back to the day that you found out uh, <laughs> that you won the award. What, how did you find out? Was it via email or phone call or what was that experience it like? It was a phone call and it was rather amazing to me. I, I've been out here working on various things. I've had a New York agent. I've had very close but, you know, very close things come almost be published in New York and, you know, I'd about given up and then this phone call comes and it was a very exciting moment uh, from the novella press hmm. and they've, they've been very amazing to publish writers uh, like myself. And what, goes through, what goes through a writer's mind who has, as you said, you had written, you had worked on other books before other stories, you, you know, had entertained the idea of being a, a, a novelist for a long time. What goes through your mind once you learn that the book's going to be published in the months and weeks leading up to publication? Well, it was very exciting. And a lot of it I've discovered, you know, it's just the writer's craft. It's the things like proofreading and checking over, which is part of what it is to be a writer and a very exciting part of what it is to be a writer, not just the creative process. And I enjoyed every minute of it. Hmm. I can imagine it would be very, very exciting, if not nerve-wracking uh, <laughs> to a degree. Uh, so how did, you know, you've, you received your PhD uh, from the University of South Carolina. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about how your background in English literature, in teaching, influences you as a writer. How, do, how does that inform, how does it give you a foundation, if you will, as a writer? Well, certainly I read a lot. And, you know, I would have to say that if I could have chosen my life career before I went to grad school, I would I'd just rather write. But since I felt like I couldn't, I decided I'd read other writers. Hmm. So to me, the, the most important part of that was really reading so many of the great writers of the world and American literature. And teaching was having to read freshman themes. And that taught me a lot about style and how to, when you have to tell a student what's wrong with the writing, you have to know yourself. And that was very valuable. So after graduating from the University of South Carolina, you uh, taught at Limestone College. I did. For, for a while, and then you moved to New York. Yes. Where you met your husband. Uh, and I met him before that, but that's oh, why I moved to New York. Okay, so that's what, well that was the, what yes. was the question was, what, what was the catalyst to, to move to New York then? Yes, my husband. I was dating him at the time. So that was, it was a good place to be for a writer. Right, and you got a job on the editorial staff at Good Housekeeping Magazine. Yes. How did that come about? I can't, through a temp agency. I actually went, to a temp agency my first day in New York. They sent me to be secretary to the president of the Hearst Publishing Corporation for a few weeks. And uh, hmm. he said, well, you know, if you'd like to work on one of our magazines, I'd be happy for you too. So I ended up at Good Housekeeping Magazine. Now, how, so, did, how did that experience, looking back on it, what, what did you learn about the publication process by working for a magazine like that? Well, I read a lot of the slush pile that came into fiction department for a while. And I, uh, so I learned how difficult it is to get something published. The rest of the time I proofread recipes and needle craft. So other than learning about proofreading symbols and how to do that, mm -hmm. I can't say that really influenced me, but being in New York certainly was an influence. Hmm. And then you taught for a while in New Jersey, right? I did. As well? Was that at the same time? Were you trying to... No, I, did. I left Good Housekeeping and did that. And that was quite an experience. I taught in New York two years after the New York riots in a community hmm. college that I literally, the door was barred and you had to have an ID to get in. Wow. And it was a very fascinating, wonderful experience. Hmm. I bet. And then you moved back to North Carolina, moved back south. I did. What was the catalyst for moving back south then? My husband. <laughs> went with him. Very so cool. Went to Boone and taught at Appalachia, and then we moved from there. Very cool. Again, the, the author is Miriam Heron. The book that we've been talking about uh, for the basis of this interview is Absolution. And some of the background and experience that went into this. Uh, I'm fascinated by folks' answers to this question. Uh, what makes for a Southern novel? Is it, is it just that the novel has to be set in the South, or is there something more substantive in terms of the, the landscape, in terms of the characters, in terms of the values and the style that, that informs a novel for it to be Southern? You know, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Um, I mean, most Southern novels are written by Southerners. So in a sense, that's part of it. And I grew up in the South, although I grew up in Miami, Florida, and people say, that's not the South. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
But I do think a southern setting is very important. And I'm sure someone not having grown up in the South, I mean, I'm writing about Boston, and I didn't live in Boston, so. Hmm. You know. How long did you live in Miami? I lived there basically 10 years and moved when I was 14. I was part of the time in Georgia before I was in Miami and then moved to Washington, D.C. So how does, how does, I mean, is Miami a, a southern, do you consider it a southern city? Well, South most people Florida? don't, but I had southern parents, right. so I think that made a difference. And so they, there's so many immigrants, I think, and you know, so many people move to, yes. to South Florida. Yes, my mother was from Georgia, my father from South Carolina, so yes, I had, I had those roots. Hmm. So what are you currently working on? You've got a, a new novel we talked about uh, on the phone. Uh, what, what's the new novel about? What can you the tell us about? The new novel is set, I've, I've set it basically in 1838, 1840. It begins in Charleston. It begins with a slave, 16 years old, who's part Indian, part black, part white. And sort of as she begins to discover some of her Indian heritage, uh, and as this, what's called the Second Seminole Indian War is going on, which was a war that the United States never won, if you go back and look at the history, it's an insurgency not unlike some mm -hmm. of the insurgencies we deal with today, where the Indians were very outnumbered, but hung on, and actually never signed a treaty with the United States, the Seminole Indians in Florida. So it will deal with some of that period. So is, is the, was the, the interest in that, you know, obviously growing up in, in Florida and wanting to know more about the history there, how important is, is, is history to you? It seems like it's a huge thing. I think history really influences my creativity. Mm -hmm. I feel like when I get a real situation and then I can bounce off of it with a fictional story, that's a very exciting combination to write about. How do you weave together then stuff that's historically accurate with, within a fictional setting? Is, oh. there, is there a balance, you know, that are you referring it's to actual, you know, historical figures and, and how, does, how does that balance work for you? Well, I think that's fun. <clears throat> I mean, I really enjoy that part of it. Uh, and, you know, there are historical characters in the novel I'm working on right now, real things that actually happen, but then I put fictitious characters in the midst of that. And I try to be faithful to the history. I try not to malign people mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and create something that they didn't do. How has, how has the research changed for you uh, in the internet age? Is it just? It's wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely amazing what I can find online. I can find whole books that would be in some obscure library sure. somewhere. Hmm. Again, the author is Miriam Heron. The book that we're talking about uh, is Absolution as well as, as her new book. Does it have a title yet, the new book? No title. No, I'm very slow on titles. And of course, they say a publisher can take your title away and title it something else. So. Sure. Uh, are, how close are you to, to finishing? The new novel. I'm two thirds of the way through, so I'm hoping in six months to have a draft. I'm slow in terms of that, but not really slow. I mean, I, I just don't churn one out every year. You just kind of keep at it. You stay with it. I stay very with it. <clears throat> How important is perseverance? Extremely. I, I don't think people can write without it. I really, I couldn't write without it. I have to go in. I used to have set certain things I had to do every day. Now I don't have to tell myself to do that, but it's extremely, mu it's part of it. When you're when you're working on a novel, uh, do and let's kind of talk about the day-to-day -day mundane things. Do you uh, do you have a word count that you set in mind? How do you know when you're done working on, you know, the book for a day? I have a basic three pages a day. I don't always meet that, mm -hmm. but once I have met it, I can quit. I could go further if I'm really onto something. I'll go further, but that's sort of what I. I so you shoot for like three pages. Is there? Is there a sense of getting the character to a certain place or a certain revelation that they have to have? Is, is that important or is it just, you know, the hard work of sticking with it for three pages every day? I think day? it's sticking with it. I think sometimes it's better to quit in the middle because it's easier to get back into it the next day. Uh, when you start in the morning, I mm -hmm. always go back and reread so many pages mm -hmm. prior. I kind of run up to where I was and come back on it and polish as I do that. Mm -hmm. and then, but if you've really ended something, then you're staring back at the blank page again, and that's much harder. Now, I know one thing that our audience is, is very interested in is you, you mentioned that you did have a literary agent uh, earlier. I don't know if you still have the same agent. I don't at the moment. But, but, but how, did you, how did you meet your, your literary agent? How 
Well, I just was very lucky. I had a friend who, who met the agent at the booksellers convention and mm -hmm. my, recommended me to her and she said, send me something. So I sent her a few short stories and she said, okay, send me the novel when you're finished. And you know, she did, two weeks after I sent it to her, she said, I want to represent you. And I said, it's not supposed to be this easy. And of course it wasn't. It was a long road after that. And so are you now looking for a new agent or are you, say, are you comfortable kind of navigating the waters of, of trying to sell the new novel on your own? Oh, I won't sell it on my own. Once I finish this draft, I'll go back. There are a couple of people who will look at it uh, okay. in New York. I have some folks that I can call on. What even, advice? Even my former agent, probably. What advice would you give for folks who are watching who maybe have a book you know, that's done or near done and, and they're trying to decide how to actually uh, publish the book, how to get an agent? What I've heard advice before of you know sending query letters, of meeting agents. It seems like a lot of people have a, a referral uh, to to find their agent. How does how does what what it's, advice would you it's give? It's not easy. I will say that in the beginning. Uh, if you're particularly if you're not a known writer, if you're, uh, but I think I mean I one guy I was on a panel with said he sent somebody said send twelve letters to twelve agents. If you have a, a book, if you're not getting anywhere with it, you might consider online publishing or self-publishing. Self-publishing used to be a dirty word. It isn't anymore because there are so many acts, ways to have your book out sure. there. Mm, something to consider. So in general, what advice would you give to, to aspiring writers? <laughs> I'd say I have a tough hide. I really think that's very important. Uh, you know, you don't find much gratification along the way. The only gratification you get is in your writing. I mean, you, you know, it's hard to publish a novel, and the great stories we hear of the great successes are very rare. Uh, mm -hmm. But you have to decide you really want to do it. You have to decide this is for you, and you'll keep up. And I get, you need to get good people to read your stuff and feed, give you feedback, not just, you know, the people who, who love you. And you need people who love you in your sure. life, or you couldn't do this. It would be too hard on your ego. But you also need to get people who will read your stuff who will be very critical. So does an agent do that? Did, it, did the agent give you feedback? Is that something that you want from, from your literary agent? I've certainly gotten good feedback from my literary agent, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly because they're the ones that have to deal with the editors. And they're the ones that have, know the market trends. Mm -hmm. But you need to get that feedback before you ever take it to an agent or you won't get very far. Mm -hmm. Again, the author is Miriam Heron. Uh, the book is Absolution. It's awesome. I totally recommend it. You should check it out. We've been talking a little bit about the uh, writing process that went into this and some of the business side of, uh, of publishing your book, of, of publishing a novel. Uh, how much editorial feedback did you get from novellas? So once they accepted it, was there much you know, back and forth with, uh, with the editor there or, or was it ready to go from that point? They went over it very carefully and I was lucky because I think I had had so many rewrites that by the time I got there they really didn't ask me to change much but they could have hmm. and they would have I think and I think they do do that when they see something hmm. which is nice because you don't always get that with New York publishers. No, they kind of so slap it into... What were some of the things that, that they changed or, or, or you know, suggested for a revision? Uh. They really didn't suggest much. I think there was one scene where they wanted to see more in Maggie's head, what she was thinking, uh, that kind of thing. Very little. There was nothing serious uh, in terms of the actual plot or the title. Mm -hmm. Now, you also have a background, a little bit of, you've done a little bit of work in advertising, public relations work. How did that experience, it sounds like you had some adventures developing video productions. I did, I did. So tell us a little bit about that and how that shapes, shapes your sense of the world around you as well. Well, when I decided to leave teaching to write, and I felt like I couldn't do both, so I had to, to, to do one or the other, because mm -hmm. I love teaching and it involved me. I did freelancing and I ended up doing television and, and doing more production type things like film and television and uh, did some very interesting things. Uh, you know, shot horses and wagons on a mountainside and uh, went to Israel and shot and just did ordinary things too that you do when you freelance. But it was a very fascinating experience and uh, I think any experience you have in life goes into your writing somewhere. Hmm. You, know, you can't have too many experiences. Sure.
So at the end of the day, uh, what is the most satisfying part of writing a novel? I think the doing of it. You know, I, I don't think I would have said that a few years ago before I got published. I would have said I have to be published or it's not satisfying. Mm -hmm. But I think the creative process is a mystery. It's a joy. It's a fascination. And then the second part is being out and talking to people and meeting people. I have loved that part of it. Hmm. It, is, it is very much a, a social thing once the book is done. It seems like you almost have to wear two hats, though. There's the part of you that when you're writing it, it is so solo. You know, you're really kind of mm -hmm. in, the, in the writing of a book by yourself, which requires a different kind of personality. And then there's the personality that once the book is done, you've, you've really got to get out there and, and, and be more extroverted and make people aware of that's the right. book. And, and but that's that fun too. That I love. Uh, but I say I'm, I'm surrounded by people on my computer all day, these people that we create. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's, that's kind of fun. So what are the, what are the ingredients that, that go into the personality, the ideal personality of a writer? Number one, discipline. I think there's nothing more than that because we really do have to, as I often tell writers groups, the first thing that you have to do is put yourself in the chair because if you don't, you'll never write. Many people write in their heads. So I, I think that, and I think some understanding or knowing of people because we write about people. It's hmm. a good answer. Well, we're just about out of time here today on The Artist Craft. Again, the author is Miriam Heron. The book is Absolution. I've read it, I recommend it, go check it out. Uh, it was published by the fine folks over at Novello Festival Press, uh, which was based out of Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Well, for all of us here at The Artist Craft, for uh, Michael and Marnie working the back, oh, I'm being told that we have one more minute to, to work on here, so. Uh, well, we, we talked a little bit about some of the advice that you would give to writers, but what are some of the things that you can do to help market a book? If you've got to, if you've got to get out and, uh, at the end of the day, you do have to sell books. So, you so what do you to have to books. do to, to help uh, promote Well, I the book? think you have to explore every avenue that's out there to market. Uh, this is one way right here uh, to try to get yourself into bookstores, to get yourself talking to people. That's, you do have to want to be around people. I, I think that's an important part. And I think you find people that can help you too. And she's got an excellent website, by the way, which I should get a, a plug in for. I think it is miriamheron.com. That's miriamheron, all one word, dot com. Well, Miriam, thank you very much for, for joining us in studio today. Uh, for all of us here at The Artist Craft, uh, Michael and Marnie working diligently and very hard in the back back there. And the good folks over in Master Control, I want to thank you all for tuning in to our program. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you. And so we should roll to credits here. And the audio will be...